You can see bird's eye view if you're switching through. <laughs> Hi, uh, well, welcome everybody to another episode of Building Site with myself, Malcolm Sparks, and Gina Antonelli. Um, haven't uh, been back from holiday, so uh, just catching up on the, this one. How are you, Gina? I'm very well, thank you. Uh, did you have a nice break? I did. I, I packed my house into boxes. Very good. So you're about to move. About to move some. Yeah. Um, yeah. I had a good break, and uh, yeah, it's good to be back. And I was kind of um, uh, uh, made a bit more progress on GraphQL, um, and it's partly I uh, wanted to show you that now. Um, and then, um, and I know I've seen a couple of previous episodes of you were doing some stuff with Alex, which is uh, good to see. So I've, I've more or less caught up with that. Uh, but anyway, this is this is the. Uh, the GraphQL kind of bit that I I did, so I'm going to um, give you a quick demo. At okay, so the first uh, the first thing is um, uh, we can imagine we have an empty ser site server and it doesn't know anything about um, what GraphQL we want to do. So I I'm, I'm going to um, show a graph a, a site resource and you can see this is this is going to be posted to site as a super user and this allows us to do post and put and we can put in a, an application graph ql and when we do a put to this resource it's going to it's going to assume that we're putting a schema over that endpoint um, and then when we post to the resource it's going to assume that we're posting a query. In, in GraphQL, queries are posts, um, but I wanted to be able to put over an updated schema. Um, you know how you've been updating your open API and just putting it over and updating it? I'd like to you know that same kind of development workflow. Um, but rather than allowing anybody to just willy-nilly turn any endpoint into a GraphQL handler, uh, I wanted to sort of have something that a super user has to do first. So for this one, I've got use our post resources friend and then we'll, we'll post that in to uh, the server. Okay, so that, that resource has been updated. Um, the next thing to demo is the GraphQL schema itself. Now, I created one earlier, and this is meant to reflect the, the, the holidays and user system that you're building. I mean, it's a bit back to front because I've just developed a quick query that is going to return all the holidays. Okay, but for for each holiday uh, that we have, um, I wanted to be able to see not the user name. I wanted to see a bit more information about the user. So I created a type called holiday, uh, and for each of these uh, attributes, I wanted to return uh, an XTDB attribute. And this is what I've used: this little annotation, or it's called a directive in GraphQL. And I've got a a, a kind of very noddy. Uh, DSL, I guess. A means just grab the attribute. So this is where you can do some simple attribute mapping. Um, now, when you when it realizes, ah, oh, this is actually another resource or another type, it will do a join. Uh, it will look up that entity in Crux, and then it will allow you to. So if you see username, this is where we pull out that attribute. So that's the schema. So I've got to tell site about that schema. So I put put it as an asset. Now I I've got to but the file schema GraphQL, we have to tell the asset the type of resource and also the path that we want to it to appear on the site server. So I'm choosing slash GraphQL uh, here. That's that's kind of a common default. But you could have many endpoints and diff one schema per endpoint. So I see your. Where are you actually? doing this, Malcolm? I see you in GraphQL, but are you doing this within the site repository or is this something? Uh, uh, right, where is the work done? The yeah. work is done in the site repository, bringing in a new library called Grab. So 99% of the work is in Grab, but there's a little uh, bit of code in site, uh, which I, I, I can show you actually. It's, it's, there's not a lot of work here. Um, so under the I don't know if the, I'll increase the screen or uh, the font size in a minute. Um, it's just this GraphQL namespace 
here. So we have mm -hmm. our put handler, which is about putting the schema. So it, it gets the schema from the the receipt the request. It can pop. Our pictures are just over some of the text. I don't know if it's. Oh, right. Okay. All right. I'll move that over there. Switching over so everyone can see. Yeah. yeah. Great. Thanks. So we compile the schema, and that potentially can cause an error. You know, if there are errors, it will catch them, and it will um, return back 400 saying there's a um, it, there's a what is 400? It means client error, something wrong with the request. And what what it will do is then um, there's some more error handling I've added to site, so you'll get some nice errors um, telling you what you did wrong. And then we just put the resource into the we submit um, uh, we submit the um, resource with this new schema attribute goes into the database and we return a 204. So all we're doing is just putting the compiled schema into the database. Um, and the compiled See, schema is just a big data structure. Yeah. yeah. I see we've half switched over from Crux to XTDB. Oh, yeah. Uh, so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, the site is still using uh, Crux, so I haven't done that upgrade. Uh, yet ah. to, you know, that we're still using an equal version of Crux, so we've, still got, we've got to do that upgrade, but that's something else. So we're still allowed to call it in place? I guess so. I don't know. Yeah. I haven't really transitioned uh, yet. So, and then we look at the post handler. This is the bit that does the query. So this does a similar thing. It takes the document string and then compiles the query. When you compile a GraphQL query, there's a load of validation steps that you need to do. So most of my work recently has been working on uh, all of the bits of validation you have to do. And um, it's all kinds of rules. Um, uh, whether you can merge, and all these kind of errors. Um, this is all contained in a, um, a really rather lovely specification, which uh, is the latest GraphQL specification. And that's, um, if you look at chapter five, chapter five is a really long chapter um, with all these kind of, you're not allowed to do this, you're allowed to do that, you're not allowed to do this. Um, so, and all these algorithms and things about. So this is just validation. And make sure that we sanitize the input and that we don't do anything, you know, that if somebody, for example, queries a type that doesn't exist in the schema, then you need to tell them. Um, so the idea is, is when you then execute the document, you don't have to do loads of checks, um, which can improve performance. So, yeah, that was that's at the bottom of that stack. So here we're, um, we compile, uh, when we do the put, of the post rather, if we compile the document into this document uh, symbol and then um, could we run it? Um, oh, and then we run a query on it. We must be running a query. Um, yeah, here at the very, very bottom, when we produce the body, we do the query, and we write out the value as a string in JSON. Uh, only supports JSON now. Um, and then this query, it calls out to this execute request, which is part of grab. Um, but with some caveats in that, there is some, um, there's, a, there's three bits that go into request execution. There's a schema which we've compiled. There's a document that we've received and compiled. And then there is a thing called a field resolver. This is the interface between the GraphQL engine and your data. So you get to uh, uh, you get to decide. Uh, so I've got two cases here. I pull out the directive, this XDDB directive or annotation, and I then and turn that into uh, Eden, and if it's a queue, then I just assume that's an XD query, and I run that against the database. And then for each result that comes out, uh, I turn it into an entity. And for the attribute case, I, uh, I 
turn the attribute, I get the attribute, I turn it into a keyword, and I pull it out of the, it's called the object value, which is the, the context object that's in the, the arg, args list. And then I look that, uh, if it's a, an object, then I, I do a lookup. Um, so that um, A, and to say holiday, that is actually A for attribute. It's not yeah. A, B, C, B, no. B, S, B, A. No, maybe I should have called it at or something, but that's just my noddy syntax at the moment in, in card that we, um, if we look at this, um, if we look at the schema here, I've called it, I can move that over here to the left, I've called that um, A for attribute here. There's one here, which is Q, and this is the thing that says, well, take this string, read it in with the Eden and, and run it, uh, which is what this thing does here. What, what are the three quote marks huh? after Q? Uh, the... What are the three? Um... In the query. So you've got Q. Uh, oh, that, right. The, this is a this is a uh, called a block string. It allows you to put in quotation marks without escaping them. So, um, and it, it trims the spacing for you. Um, it's a it's a feature of uh, GraphQL. Um, uh, yeah. So the GraphQL language has. Um, Uh, yeah, I, I think it's called a block block string. Um, block string. Here we are. So you can see this these three quotation marks, speech marks, um, and then you can it will preserve all of the the formatting for you. Um, so it's pretty good for documentation, and, and a lot of GraphQL is around providing good descriptions about types, and so you can kind of go to, you know, write a whole essay about a type, and not have to worry about escaping your speech marks. So it's pretty cool. So mm. That's what that does. Okay, so let's let's try it then. So I've got to, I'm going to put that schema into. Um, so this would be this would be a suggested workflow for you, Jonah, when you're working mm -hmm. on card, that you would move over to GraphQL and you would construct your own queries. Um, again, but then you might say, well, actually, I would like to do, I would like to pull out the you know, the Slack pictures, the avatars, or the you know, I'd like to you know the dietary information. I'd like to pull that out. So you'd have to figure out, well, where is that in the database? I need to start writing some. Uh, XD queries and bind them onto my own type system. So you'd be kind of inventing the, this sort of, uh, you'd be defining what is a holiday, what is a user, what, uh, what and, and when I, what I mean user, what does that mean in an, an XD query? What, you know, what, you know, so you can define the whole tree and then you can be, then you can write GraphQL queries that will use that schema. Um, so most of the time you'll be writing queries, but sometimes you'll be think, thinking, ah, oh, I need a, I need my query to do something that's not currently possible, so I need to update it. Um, so you would write, if you had to update your schema, I guess you'd be doing this not so often, or you might, you might, you know, in another organization, you might decide that the, the domain experts are the ones that are going to come up with the, the schema, and the UI programmers, they get to do the GraphQL queries, but they never get to see the XD part of the, the system. That's sort of provided by another team. So am I right in thinking part of the beauty of GraphQL is that you define a schema for a user, for example, and that could have a name, address, age, um, national insurance number, and when you do your GraphQL query, you can only you only have to query what you're interested in, so yeah. you can just get the user's name. Exactly. And that's yeah, fine. Yeah. And 
with the same schema, you can go and get as much or as little as you need. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. In the same way, in a relational database, you can have you know hundreds of tables which make up the schema, but you you're not uh, obligated to query from all of them. You can just query from one. Um, so, the, so once these schemas are in and and well established, they they shouldn't need to be touched too much. No. Um, which no. is good. Well, I'll, I'll put that asset there, and uh, so that's that's how I've updated the GraphQL endpoint. So that has a new schema. But just to show that it is very common for, by default, you have a type called query, and in many GraphQL schemas, then you would have, you know, dozens of uh, root level attributes. So you could say, oh, this is how I get my holidays, or this is how I get my my users, this is how I, you know, would get my um, timesheet bookings. This is how, so, so almost anything in the card system uh, for your application might have a, a, a root. Uh, so holidays is a root, but you might have many of them. Um, so now that we've put it into the system, let's try and do a post. Now I've, I've put my query here in a in a file. Although you can just write it, um, I can just write it using data as a string. So if we did that, I just say, give me just the IDs of my holidays in the system. If I'm only looking for holiday IDs, um, I need to send this post to an endpoint, and I need to tell this is just a common or garden post. Uh, so I need to tell it what type. The, the content that I'm sending, or the data I'm sending to it, which uh, is just a string. I'm telling it that this is actually GraphQL, because um, we could it, we could embed it in a JSON body or something like that. So I'm going to do that, and that should that has given us all the IDs uh, of every holiday. Now I'm I'm going to make that um, put this minus s, which means we. We only get the output so that I can pipe it through um, JQ, which makes it a little easier to to read. Okay, so if I was to change my query now, and I'll do do one that actually demonstrates something more complex. So let's take the holiday, the ID, and for start date and description, and for each user, we'll just have their ID, user, and name, and email. So let me write that one. So we do a site, post, this time we say file, and we give the name of the file. The path is still the endpoint. Same endpoint, but where we're, where we're sending the query. Um, and, then, and that might be that you have a UAT or a, a development version of your schema that you're testing out, but still um, you're still refining. and Or you might be launching a, a new version of your schema and you want uh, applications to choose whether they want to use it. Okay, so we'll finish the type and that will give us more information which we, we want to type through JQ. Uh, so this is going to be um, and uh, I guess this is a kind of, I, you know, I don't want to kind of on the video show everybody who's watching this where all ducks people are going on holiday, so that's that. You can see it's actually uh, it's pretty fast, and this is in production. This is going off to our AWS machine. So um, yeah, that that is it really. Still a few more things that I've got to do to, around GraphQL features like interfaces and unions uh, and variables and enums, but um, the the core of it is working. Oh, and this is on site now, or are you working off a branch? No, this is deployed in site today on Master, so you can play play with this today. And I've I've put a little readme in card, so and this is on GitHub public. So uh, if you go to if you go to your card repo, you'll see there's a GraphQL um, subdirectory, and then there's a readme that explains uh, how to how to hit it. People who are um, uh, using this won't won't be able to hit the Jux production server because they won't have the the, the permissions to, um, but they will be able to.
play with their own site servers they will be able to you know if you, you look at the site read me for that and some of our other building site episodes so it's not from what i can tell too dissimilar from working with the open api we, we were doing that from within card and then when that was ready we'd put that onto site um likewise we do that with the graphql resources we work yeah. on that in card it lives in card but when it's ready to go live essentially we put that onto site as long as you've got the right credentials yeah there. yeah exactly it's it's really uh, the same idea as you've got your open api in the card directory so currently the the schema we we sort of think that the schema is really closer to the domain than the the applicator that the, um a, a schema is should be application contextual so it's the application developers who uh, it, there's a sort of duel between you know when you write code that enclosure might pull out things from maps or properties or in java you might be calling methods and getting fields out of it um, that it's better to allow an application developer to uh, influence what a schema looks like uh, rather than have this attempt at a global all-encompassing schema domain that that um, uh, that addresses every single need in your organization so because you end up with this like vast uh, model which and it, you need lots of people to agree on and have lots of meetings and councils and it's just a slow process um, so the the schema here the open api and the the graphql schema kind of belong in their application so card will say that this is this is the graphql for card it doesn't mean that other applications can't build their own apis um, so what just a quick question i might miss this what distinguishes um the resources put in from card from or how does site tell the difference is there something in the resources uh yeah file? oh i see because we're putting it at slash graphql um yeah so how does site know that this is from card it it doesn't actually um and maybe it maybe it should and maybe this should be deployed at slash card slash graphql because um, so if, if someone else came along and deployed something for slash folk, not that that yeah. exists anymore, would that just at the minute overwrite it? Yeah, it would. Yeah, yeah, you've, yeah. that's a good point. Um, and perhaps we need to think about rules. So you might say, well, I'm going to allow these roles to override my card GraphQL, but I don't want these users to be able to do it. And, um, so there might be a different set of users who are allowed to update the schema as to as to people who are allowed to call the GraphQL. I mean, the GraphQL might be public, although commonly GraphQL is a contract between a user interface developer and, and a backend system. Um, but it might well be public, um, and yet you'd have different rules. Uh, and that's where the uh, we need to do a bit more work on sites author authorization. Uh, but right now, we just say, you know, everybody's a super user. It looks awesome. Yeah. So I guess I guess the next job is to move over more than just holidays. Yeah, exactly. Um, um, did you have anything that you were working on? Did you? Should we leave it to another time, or did you want to? Yeah. No, I've not. Um, Alex warned me that there was uh, some things gonna be happening, so it wouldn't make much sense to do too much. So I've been trying to set up my TypeScript environment in my emails. Yeah, that's something I'm going to have to try to do too. I'm looking forward to uh, setting all that up, and I, I've, I've seen your your videos. So yeah, I think that's the next step is to try and uh, update Card and, and finish that off, and then we'll move it to GraphQL. And so hopefully in a, a couple of weeks, GraphQL will be all ready to use, and we can start using it in anger. In in that, you know, there's things that I want to do around error handling. I think if you you know if you make a mistake with your errors. Uh, I think I've got. I, I could try. I could try a quick demo here of what would happen if you um, put in a schema that has some errors. So let's try and do that. that site. Oh, so let's.
so let's go and make a change to this. Uh, let's call that string two. So what would happen? That would, and then we get an error saying a field must return a type that is known. Um, so that is, you know, a real compilation error. But I haven't done all of them, and mm -hmm. it would be really painful, as you know. Um, you remember that demo I did with OpenAPI, and I got the OpenAPI wrong, and it, it just didn't come up with any errors, and it was really embarrassing. They're the fun. best kind of errors. Yeah, yeah. So I'm determined that won't happen, and GraphQL can be a little bit confusing if you if you build a big one. So I want to be able to zoom in exactly on the line number and the column number where you've made the mistake, and um, as you can see, this doesn't do that yet. Um, but I do have the information. I'm using Antler, and Carl Kingsbury's uh, CLJ and the library, and um, in that, all of the line, number, and column information is returned as metadata. So I, I have access to all that information from the parser. So I just need to uh, bubble it up to the user. But um, just to put you on the spot and rewind completely, what what inspired you to do the switch to GraphQL or to invest so much time? I I. Um, Over open API. Yeah, that's a really good question. I, I have a, I have a, a suspicion it's going to be easier and more productive to work with GraphQL uh, for cards. Uh, I'm also quite well. I'm quite keen, even though JSON schema is very powerful. I think that there's some features in. GraphQL that I think that we can explore, exploit. So being able to model what a card is, um, is a card a holiday? Is it an application form for, a, you know, a, is it a meeting room request? Is it, uh, you know, is it, a, is it some minutes from meeting? So there's lots of different types. So the card is the thing, but there's going to be lots of subtypes where we're going to say that you know, in order to meet this criteria, a card has to have a start date and an end date, and a, you know, a holiday description. And then it, by having those things, it becomes a holiday booking. Um, so that's that evolution that we were talking about. And there is a, a feature in GraphQL called interfaces, which if I, I show the, the, the type system, um, this is concept of an interface where you can say, well, a person is a you know a named entity is anything that has a string, a valued entity is anything that has a value which is an int, and then you can see that this this business has a has a uh, is a named entity and a valued entity. So we'd be able to say a holiday must have a date range, right? And then we'd say there's a such a thing called a, a date range interface. The advantage there, and that that would have you know in this case a start date and an end date. And when we're trying to visualize our cards, we could say, you know, that year planner that I've been kind of dreaming about, see all of my, all the things I need to see over the year, my, my, my plan for the year, I can see it in one visualization, that that can pick up any and render on the timeline anything that has a start date and an end date. But it wouldn't be able to render things that didn't have that. So how do we, how do we begin to create a type system where we can um, in, in a in a language like the um, and GraphQL has this schema definition language so we can go and um, uh, in card create all kinds of different concepts and in uh, and write them up in this in this language and then send them into site so site will then be aware via GraphQL of what it means to be a contact um, so that's why I have a suspicion that the interfaces are going to be important as a, mm -hmm. as a building block. Um, but I think open API is still a very, very good thing to provide. Uh, sometimes you want you you know you, uh, you want to integrate with an external system and they want to give you a rest response. Sometimes you want to produce things that are not JSON. You want to, like a CSV feed to a downstream system. So having a general REST API is good. And I have a feeling that REST APIs will become the, the default for public uh, open APIs that are uh, accessible to other systems. 
and that GraphQL will find a niche for a contract between a, a UI developer of an application and the back end of an application. So from just listening to podcasts and kind of spending a bit of time reading and articles and blogs, I, I get the suspicion that not many organizations are giving a all-encompassing GraphQL API. There's, there's GitHub, which is the famous one, but I'm not sure that Stripe and Twilio and all the others are, are going to follow suit. I think GraphQL has a real, is really powerful in, in our use case where we've got a very sophisticated front-end application, which is what Facebook, the Facebook client application is, and uh, you know, a very, very uh, flexible back-end and we want something to to allow us to pull data out of crux without the power of being able to write you know, XT queries. Yeah, I thought was a long-winded answer, Joanna, uh, but I hope that makes sense. Covered it. Mm. No, it does make sense. So are we going to support both OpenAPI and GraphQL Insight so people can pick and choose? Yeah, definitely. I think that's the decision not to not to bet on one, any one horse and to allow people to make that decision for themselves. Um, so if they choose to use GraphQL, they can use that, they can do REST, or they can do a hybrid, they can do a bit of both where it makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, but really they're very similar to each other and that you know, I, I don't think it's a case that um, one is better. I think it depends on your context. Mm, definitely. Cool. All right then. Uh, Okay, well, I think that wraps up that uh, that demo, and, and thanks for watching. And um, I'll see you again soon, Joanna. <laughs>